Welcome everybody to our woman to woman interview and I'm super excited to introduce you to Dr. Jenny Schuyler from the Intimacy Institute and Dr. Jenny is a sexologist right and um, a, an int intimacy expert and sex expert and um, a therapist so I want to just ask Dr. Denny to tell us a little bit about how I'm always very interested to find out how people got into the work that they got into. So I would love to hear your story of how you became a sexologist. Sure. Yeah. Um, and maybe for people who don't know what sexology is, that's uh, it's it's the study of human sexuality. So um, I guess I would actually be called a clinical sexologist, but I'm also a certified sex therapist. So sometimes sexologists are journalists or educators, um, and sometimes they're therapists or counselors. Oh, uh, good. So Thanks for pointing sort of that a, out. Yeah, it's a universal, it's a little bit more of an umbrella term, and then there's a few different career fields people have underneath that. So okay, that's the umbrella term, and then I'm a certified sex therapist and licensed marriage and family therapist. Okay. Um, but I started, you know, I would guess my journey started really as a child with a dad who was a medical doctor and wanted me to know everything in the world. So got lots of books, got lots of educational videos at age appropriate times. And sex was never a silent or taboo subject. And so you fast forward time and, you know, in high school, I was the one that people came to for questions because I had answers. <laughs> and I, you know, I just thought, oh, okay, I have answers. I, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think I would have a career out of it, but it was sort of a fun way to interact with friends. So it became a topic of passion just because it was sort of this fun taboo topic that no one else had real answers for. And then in college at the time, Eve Ensler was offering colleges to do her performance of the vagina monologues. And, okay. <laughs> and so, and I'm 40. So this was 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at the time she allowed uh, an individual or an original monologue, um, up to three of them actually in each college. And that's, I don't think that's any, I don't think anyone can do that anymore. I mean, that's my understanding. But at the uh -huh. time, there was a small window of time where she said, write your own monologue and you can still deliver it as part of my bigger vagina monologues in terms oh, of your college fun. performance. That's yes. awesome. I love that story. <laughs> it was great. I did one on female pleasure because it was, seemed to be missing, um, from her script. And I think that was really the beginning of, I love this topic. This is a missing conversation. This is a missing area. And when I ended up going to grad school, that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to study psychology. I'm going to study therapy. I'm going to integrate sex therapy and sexology into it. And so I kind of had to bushwhack my way through and piece together all these different components to my particular career that I'm in now. But that was sort of the beginning seeds of what bloomed into what I do now. That's so refreshing to hear. Like also just the fact that you were raised um, with a clinical background in the sex, sex education. And so it didn't kind of like, you know, sometimes when you're, especially when your parents teach you things, you're kind of like, eh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm always trying mm -hmm. to teach my daughter about her body and she's like, ah, she's a little bit interested now, but I was one of those kids that like, it was very taboo, but I was very interested. I had three older brothers mm -hmm. and I was always very interested in sex. And I had older cousins yeah. who taught me about things and, you know, I was, but I never felt comfortable talking about it with my parents. So I'm really jealous that you yeah. had that upbringing and were able to talk about it freely. And because you have definitely have a freeness when you're talking about it, like you just make people at ease. I listen, I watch your videos, you. your, um, sexy savvy sex in 60 seconds mm -hmm. and um you just you. it's just so like matter of fact and you make it feel so comfortable for people to talk about right and Thank even you. in my clinic when I'm working with my clients and I'm talking asking them how their sex life is it's very hard for them to really come you know come to the plate and tell me you know what's going on I have to really dig in there and very carefully okay. so it's it's definitely a gift to be able to talk about it openly and freely right yeah for sure. Yeah. For so sure. I'm sure your clients really appreciate that. And so the, the Intimacy Institute, you work with your husband, correct? I do. Yes. And do I you do. treat together or do you, like, how does that work? No, it's separate. So we, okay. we both see our own separate client base. Sometimes I'll see a couple and they'll want individual therapy with him 
or vice versa. He'll see a couple and I'll do an individual therapy. And, and one of the, one person in the couple will be my client. And so then we'll do coordinated care and they sign off on ROIs, release of information forms. And then, and then we do coordinated care, just the way we do coordinated care with you or other pelvic floor therapists or um, urologist, gynecologist, endocrinologist, whatever the issue is presenting, you know, mm-hmm. we like to coordinate care because that's important, but we have a fully different client base. Okay. And where are you? Did you move? Are you still in Boulder? No, we moved. We're in the mountains um, in the, we're in the Roaring Fork Valley in a town called, um, it's right near Carbondale. Okay. And mountain yeah. life. Cool. Mountain life. Yeah. And do you so see do teletherapy. couples virtually too, or is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Only virtually at this point. Oh, okay. Only virtually at this point. Yeah. Great. So some people have actually driven up and we'll meet face to face if they happen to be in the area. Oh, um, nice. But face to face has been working and it's at, it's been a, we, what we've been able to do is actually broaden our support to all of Colorado and nice. not just the Boulder area. So that's been nice. Perfect. Yeah. And, um, so you are you very busy, right? <laughs> Seems <laughs> like it. You're you're um part of the Adam and Eve. Tell us about that. What's what's that all about? The savvy. Sex? Um. Yeah. So Adam and Eve is a sex toy company. They've got lots of great products, and basically, I'm their sex expert. Um. So they're um, they call me the resident sexologist, mm-hmm. and I offer all the sexual health and sexual education. Um, components for them, mostly on media and social media. So I'll do a lot of writing for um, publications and then I'll do social media things like the Savvy Sex in 60 Seconds is a very quick 60 to 90 second clip of uh, name the theme, right? Whatever the theme is, I'll do a short piece of education on it and then they post it on their Instagram channel. Nice. Yeah. Um, So tell me about your past, you have any passion projects going on right now? Do you have any like courses or anything like that that you're working on besides uh, yeah. the work with the clinical work? Oh, so so projects outside of work, just like personal projects? No, no, like work, pro- you know, related to your profession. Oh, okay. Yeah, my husband and I, we used to have couples retreats and with COVID, we're like, we need to offer, we wanted to offer our couples retreat in a way that people could still access. So we made it into a whole video format. So that's that's a cool offering. We have this e-course for couples and it walks couples through, it's very didactic and educational. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that you can take it at whatever speed you want. Most people will take in five, 10 minutes of a section and then work on that for a week, a few weeks, uh-huh. and then come back to it. So it's, it's scalable for their lives, um, but it walks them through what we call our roadmap to intimacy which we're hoping to put into a book as well, but we're very busy. We have young sons. Um, And yeah, so Roadmap to Intimacy is basically our approach to helping couples emotionally, physically, sensually, and sexually. And it's a protocol to really get people the foundation of safety and trust so that they they can have connection and then from the connection, deeper intimacy. Awesome. Um, I think there's a lot of people in in our community that would be interested in that. Um, So that's a great thing because... I'm going to sit, that's a great segue into talking about all of the different aspects of sexuality. And um, so I posed a question in our group, you know, told them that you were going to be my guest. And I said, you know, what burning questions do you want answered (laughs) from Dr. Jenny? And a couple of people had in different ways voiced um, this question. And so I'm going to pose it and then I'll give you my little two cents on it. But then I want you to, I would love for you to elaborate on it. So why are men so much more interested in sex than women? Like why, and why does their desire seem to never go down? And, and then somebody else said, you know, how can we balance the male and female desires? So I don't necessarily, I feel like that's a generalization because I don't necessarily know that that's for tr- for sure true. I mean, I know that there's hormones at play, but don't me- I think men's testosterone goes down as well or their horm- hormone levels go down with age. But um, yeah, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, um, sometimes in a heterosexual marriage or partnership, um, it'll be the male partner who has a lower sex drive. Typically it's... Um, because the relationship is really on the rocks, 
um, or there's another mental health piece like severe depression, um, or there's a chronic illness or cancer type thing where they have to take androgen deprivation therapy and it zaps all the testosterone. So mm -hmm. the truth is testosterone absolutely is the sex drive hormone, period. Mm -hmm. That is why men typically overarchingly have a higher sex drive and it seems mm -hmm. unending. And even though they go through andropause and slowly drop and whittle away, we just fall off a cliff <laughs> um, with menopause. But even, mm -hmm. even if you take a man at his lowest point, maybe in his like 80s, right? Uh -huh. um, he will still have probably at least 200 points of testosterone above a woman's natural level. We have we have a we have a level um, basically between four and and one twenty for very very high testosterone women who are taking mm -hmm. testosterone therapy. Most people, most women kind of fall in the sixty range, like the number sixty for their free testosterone level, and men's range is really three fifty to nine fifty. Some doctors will give it two fifty to eleven fifty, depends on who asks. But mm -hmm. really, a healthy man will kind of shake out in the wash anywhere between five to 800, uh -huh. which is a huge number more than it take our average at 60. Yeah. So if you, if you just think about it now, hormones are not the only thing that inspired right. the desire and it's right, not right, the right. only thing that drives us to have sex. Hormones are a small piece of the puzzle, but if you have testosterone always easily accessible like this, Mm -hmm. basically what it means is your arousal is always easily accessible all you got to do is be like ding okay <laughs> i'm kind of the, the, that's the function of testosterone now obviously the brain is way more powerful yeah. and can go uh, uh i've got lots of negative sex messages i've got religious messages i've got relationship messages i've got fear of rejection right we've got all these things that block us from that easy arousal but generally speaking if we're not blocked by those things, the testosterone is the easy access into our sex drive. And sex drive is actually not a clinical term, easy access into our arousal, the physiological experience of being turned on. Right. And so, so how do we, um, in a heterosexual relationship, right? When, when we're, mm -hmm. when we're perimenopausal or menopausal or, or just, you know, for me, it really, sometimes it really isn't, I know the human. hormones is just human. Part, human yeah just like you know being a mom being a busy mom or you know having scar tissue or pain with intercourse like the, there's like a million other things that are right are part of it but um I guess I guess the question they're asking is well like why doesn't that seem to bother the men as much as the women in in these relationships you know so it, without extra testosterone support it's it's like basically think about being hungry Mm -hmm. If you, if your belly never said, I'm hungry, like literally that physical pang of hunger, you just kind of knew like, well, breakfast time, then it's lunchtime and it's dinner time. Mm -hmm. But if the pangs never occurred, never happened in your body, you might be like, well, I'll skip a meal. I'll skip another meal. You mm -hmm. might just kind of forget to eat. Let's say you add in that eating is complicated and doesn't taste that good. And then you don't even have the pangs for hunger, which we're comparing to testosterone. You might avoid it altogether. Okay. And so the, the, the hunger pangs are analogous to the remind the physiological reminder uh, in, in the body. That's what testosterone is. It's a physiological reminder. It's why I kind of joke with men, like they got to clean their tubes every once in a while because testosterone <laughs> will be like, I am building up. <laughs> they can clean their tubes however they want, but there is a re reality to yeah. that release and it, it will be a nocturnal emission if it's not released in other ways. Right. So the, testosterone finds its way but that is also why women it, it can you know if there's no reminder in the body um and some women feel that reminder during ovulation and mm -hmm. some don't um then it just it, it doesn't occur to them in the same way there's got to be a different pathway into it right yeah. so um in my program I, I help women to like invigorate the pelvic region and that mm -hmm. actually helps my arousal so mm -hmm. um becoming embodied and doing all that kind of thing, right? So um, other than that, are there other ways that a woman can can work on that, that, you know, maybe isn't necessarily connecting with that part of themselves as much? Or, you know, you know, how do you, and then there's, de so desire and arousal, they're two different things, right? And yeah. so that you have to have both to really have that 
connection, right? Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, how do, if, if someone's having a hard time with that, like, how would they? How do you inspire desire? I think is the question. It's the yeah, million exactly. dollar question. How, how, do you, how yeah. do you get in touch with that? If you're, if it's kind of been, you know, your partner's up yep. here and you're like down here. Yeah. It's the most common thing I see in my practice. And yeah. I call it desire discrepancy. And every couple typically has this desire discrepancy. They usually come to my office when it's gotten really severe. Um, and sometimes it's a symptom of the relationship. And sometimes um, it's the cause of relationship issues. Either way, you need to solve it. It takes two to tango. So it's not just women as a problem. How do we invigorate our desire, right? Exactly. It needs to be the partnership. What are they doing to inspire desire, right? It's a team sport. What are we doing for the relationship to build safety, to build foreplay, emotional foreplay, sensual foreplay? Um, so I want to just name that as like a lot of women go, I am the problem. I have low desire. I say that's crap, right? Your di desire is your desire and it's totally fine. Right. And what you want to do is find satisfaction and pleasure in a pressure-free way with your partner, whatever that looks like. Um, so all that said, when, when what I'm still asking both people in the partnership to do is take responsibility for their end. So a man might have to manage his arousal more, self-pleasure more, do more in the way of foreplay emotionally, physically, sensually. And a woman, and I'm talking heterosexually here, and a woman might have to um, figure out how to take responsibility for her arousal and desire. So what you're speaking to, Michelle, is how do you take responsibility for your physical arousal through the pelvic floor? Awesome. Like getting mm -hmm. into that connection and opening things up. And I imagine lots of breath work, right? Like Absolutely, all of yeah. that inspires the body to get turned on. Now, remember, this is the biggest sex organ though. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Happens between the ears, not the legs, yes. right? Yes. The <laughs> biggest sex organ. Yeah. So what I say is we got to know some basic facts that help us get there. One is if we just, if we like our partner and we just make time for it and crawl into bed and take off our clothes, things will happen. We have to prioritize crawling into bed and taking off our clothes in a pressure-free way, right? Yeah. Let's setting aside 30 minutes to just hang out and kind of kiss and talk and touch and cuddle and let things slowly evolve because oftentimes we're just busy, we're tired, we're squeezing it in at night and we're not swinging from the chandeliers with all this energy having this like spontaneous passionate experience is not what we usually have once in the blue moon great right. on vacation great but if you're going to go for a regular sex life that maintenance kind of lazy kind of slow relaxed origin of sex is really the norm and just carving out the time for that when when everything else is working right allows for sex to happen and by the way sex can be anything i'm not just saying intercourse so that's one thing to recognize. Another thing to recognize is that arousal needs relaxation. And I imagine when you teach these exercises, it's about re breath and relaxing yeah. and opening. Same for the whole body arousal, right? We, that's where it comes from the parasympathetic nervous system. It emerges from a place of relaxation. So sex actually starts from a relaxed place. Um, and then we get kind of kicked up and turned on. But if we're stressed, if we're tired, if we're angry, it's very difficult especially without testosterone or much testosterone mm -hmm. to have sex. It just, it, it really is difficult to kind of get there. So there's that piece. Um, and then the last piece to consider is, is desire, right? And Rosemary Bassoon was a pioneer of this concept, but it's not spontaneous. It's responsive to expect spontaneous desire to just pop. Oh, I'm, I'm in the mood. I'm going to invite my partner. I'm going to just, yeah. here it is, it is really not how we work at all but we respond to touch, right? We might respond to our arousal waking up and then the brain goes, oh, I'm glad I'm here. Mm -hmm. We respond to emotional contact. We respond to you know, um, romance. We respond to different ways that our eroticism gets turned on, maybe conventionally or unconventionally. So we respond to different um, invitations. It doesn't mean just a, hello, I'd love to have sex with you, although that could work. Right. Um, so that responsive desire is key to kicking those gears into action. So I also say though, you can respond to yourself. If you're taking responsibility for yourself, I'll be honest, like I actually wrote a whole blog article on this. So my husband gave me feedback that I was kind of 
going into dead fish mode. (laughs) (laughs) I had my second kid, my second kid was young and I'm like, okay, touch me. You know, I was not really doing any work and I was like, oh, you know, you're kind of right. And so I then was like, okay, you know, I'm going to put on music I like and I'm going to dance with myself first. I'm going to wear something I like. And I'm, and then I got inspired to dance for him. And then I sort of brought breath and excitement to it. I basically challenged myself to turn myself on and then bring that energy to him. And so that was really useful in thinking about my desire. If I'm taking responsibility for my desire, what do I need to do to turn myself on? I've had so many different clients say, oh, well, first I need to go for a big hike and get that energy out of my system and replenish Mm. with nature. Or I need to have a salad or I need to have a glass of wine or I want to take a, you know, walk and, and just decompress. So knowing what you need to be able to access yourself is key. That's long awesome. answer. I love that. <laughs> Me, I love that. Um, it brings up a, a couple more topics. So one of the things, prioritizing sex. Um, and I've told this to many of my clients and a lot of times, and, you know, and I've, I've had that reaction to myself. Like, you know, when you're scheduling it, it kind of makes it like a task. You know what I mean? So it does. It sort of takes away the the fun and excitement around it. Like, I don't believe. I'm going to challenge that. that. You know, I'm going to challenge yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> that's what yeah. they tell me, and so I, yeah. you know, I can. Kind I hear of, it too. I can understand that, but how can we get rid of that idea that it's a task that we have to yeah. do rather than like we get to do? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is a task if you treat it like a task, and usually people feel that it's a task. Um, oftentimes because they're highly productive people. Type A or highly productive people um, don't like scheduling sex because it's it's another task to do. Um, And now this doesn't mean you are solely a productive person. If you think about, and I I don't want to go too deep down the psychology wormhole here, Mm -hmm. but if you think about our humanity as being sort of a portfolio of parts, our productive part is just one part of us. So if you powwow with this part, right? If you're like, okay, high productive part. I hear that you're feeling like sex is a task. Do you mind going to the waiting room, hanging out over there? And I would like to have my access to myself so that I can show up in a way that's more excited or more relaxed. And so again, it's challenging your brain to go, I don't have to, yeah, it could be a task. If I just squeeze it in on Sunday, there it is, eight o'clock. Okay, make make sure I get there Mm -hmm. versus, Sunday, eight o'clock, if you think about your first two, five, seven dates with your partner, Mm -hmm. really exciting. You probably knew what time they were, you were being picked up. You probably knew what you were going to wear multiple days ahead of time. You probably took a great shower and played music and got yourself excited. (laughs) So if you treat it that same way of like, oh, eight o'clock. All right. What am I going to do ahead of time for the day? Oh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go for my big hike that day. And then I'm going to take my shower. I'm going to play my music, right? I'm going to send some flirty texts back and forth. Mm -hmm. If you treat it as a fun date, it can be. If you treat it like a task and roll in at eight with like, all right, I'm here. Then it will be that. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. I love that (laughs) idea of, you know, when you were first courting or dating or whatever, you just like think about it in those terms and, you know, it's going to be pleasurable and take away the uh, the pressure, right? Because if you have like this window of time to make that date, then you feel like there's a lot of pressure around that, like, you know, that we need to get rid of that pressure, right? That it just has to be more of a relaxed yeah. engagement. And part of the pressure is sex has to look a particular way. I always debunk this, right? It doesn't have to only be intercourse. It doesn't have to only be we kiss and then we take off our clothes and then we have genital play and then we have intercourse and then we have orgasm, right? The routine that sort of society conditions us to believe is the script. Get rid of that, right? Make it all about pleasure, you know? Jump in the shower and that sucks. Uh, Have a kissing date, that sucks. Touch each other and sensually massage, that sucks, right? It could be anything you want it to be if you allow yourself to have a unique script that doesn't have the pressure built in. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, I have another question. Let's see. Go for it. Did somebody ask me? Oh, two things. And you can choose because I know we don't have forever, but um, fine. identifying what is pleasurable, one question. And the other one is how to communicate what we want with our partners. So I know those are two, yeah. 
two different things. <laughs> two different things, but you can you can choose whichever one you want. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I can do both. Let's do communication okay. first. Uh, and you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, difficult to talk about sex, and it is, you know, yeah. it is, and it's interesting because we're kind of hyperbolic in certain areas of our society about sex. We're we're almost hypersexual. Um, and yet when it still comes to being vulnerable with your partner in a one-to-one -one way, it's difficult. It's like, oh, I can talk about it maybe with my girlfriends and I can talk about it at a party and I can read about it in Cosmo, but like in the bedroom is difficult. And I always actually joke with my couple, it's easier to have sex than talk about it. So it's key. The communication is key. And I say, let's not start talking about it in the bedroom. That's where I talk about my road not to intimacy. We talk about it at the emotional intimacy phase. We talk about it on a date, we talk, you know, on a dinner date, you know, we talk about it on a walk with the dog. We talk about it in safe places that are not related to sex so that we don't feel the pressure that whatever we're talking about has to then get acted out, right? So if we weave in what, it, I can weave in what is pleasurable in a moment, but how do you talk about sex and what you want? Uh, not during sex, <laughs> right? Not to start, right? For sure. Um, yeah. And it's still not that easy. Right? right. I have lots of exercises I'll have my couples consider and do. And, you know, some of the things, what do I like? Or for some, sometimes we don't know. So may, let's make a list of what we don't like. And usually the antidote and the opposite is what we like. Um, pleasure. What is pleasure? Things that we like. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting, Michelle. My mission statement on my website is um, giving all people permission for pleasure. And the reason I say permission for pleasure is because mm -hmm. we are so socially conditioned not to have permission for pleasure. We have social and religious and family of origin messages that all say pleasure is dangerous. Arousal and desire is dangerous. Oh, you feel that tingle? Nope, repress it down. Mm -hmm. um, even with, you know, vulvodynia and dyspareunia, you know, some of these painful intercourse conditions absolutely are they somatic and the brain gets involved and goes, I'm guarding. I'm protecting. That's my mm -hmm. job. I'm closing down because I have a job and the body is brilliant and the body goes no. Um, and so the no is usually because it wasn't safe to feel pleasure growing up somehow, or there was a sexual violation. It wasn't, you know, it's like I'm protecting and guarding. So permission for pleasure and accessing your pleasure is not so easy. It's not just a, oh yeah, sure. I'll have pleasure. It's actually working with the things that block us from our pleasure. And those are usually old, like yeah. way back childhood, adolescence kind of things. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a work. It's a piece of work to do that um, for all of us. Yeah, I love that permission for pleasure. I think, yeah. you know, that's a big, it's a good motto to have, or a good theme to yeah. have, a good mission statement, because um, why is that? Why is it so hard for us? You know, why is it? You know, it's just been just scary and answers. dangerous for for thousands of years. This yeah, is it just makes me so sort of been, I know, I know. <laughs> but we've been <laughs> brought up to to think that way, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of healing to be done. So, thank you so much for your brilliant answers, and um, this is so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. I'm, if you have any more, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I mean, I just, there's so many, we could just go down the whole rabbit hole. But I think um, if people have more questions and they, or they want to reach out to you, they can reach you through the intimacyinstitute.org. And that's where your, um, your course is as well. Yeah, you that's can true. find the course there as well. Yeah. yeah. And um, how long is the course? Like, give us a little info on like, how many is it? I guess it's a self self-paced right so it's a self-paced it's three and a half hours of material but it's okay. self-paced and I usually say don't sit there for three and a half hours straight and watch it again it's divided into four sections emotional then physical then mm -hmm. sensual and then sexual intimacy um and sometimes people are like oh yeah I got all those tools and I know communication I've got skills and tools there I, and I give seven different main key skills and tools for emotional mm -hmm. intimacy and some couples are like, oh, all of these are new. And some are like, got them. Um, so just move on to the next chapter. Easy. Uh -huh. And the course is only $159. It's oh, lifetime. Awesome. You can just use it at any time. Some people bought it and 
waited another month to open it. It's fine. <laughs> um, it's like and, all those books on my shelf that are going to like just go yeah. into my brain. <laughs> yeah, I understand that concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally understand it. Um, yeah, is there is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like people to know about you or to know about any about sex, about anything that we didn't cover? Um, you know, I would just say maybe for your population in particular, the relationship between the psychological, relational, and somatic. Um, I love working with pelvic floor physical therapists, especially you, because I think it's such a key part of the triad in terms of whole healing. Um, so even when our bodies get the healing, our brains don't always <laughs> compute that. And so we're still scared of sex or we still kind of shake, get shut down. Or we, you know, we don't always how to know how to com complete the healing. Um, and so when I work with women or, or couples um, who are in that process of healing from any kind of painful intercourse, for instance, um, it is creating more permission for pleasure, more pain-free contact, sometimes not even intercourse, oftentimes not even intercourse. Let's get creative with our connection. And let's also build our connection and safety for vulnerability because oftentimes vulnerability is very scary and that's why part of the why we're shutting down. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that relationship. It's so key. And, you know, we, there's a lot of great sex therapists out there. I'm not the only one doing this kind of work who really help people with the, the relational psychological component of painful intercourse. Yeah, it's a big piece of it for sure. You know, I've, I've often said, uh, I've had some clients that come to me for dyspareunia and then they start talking to me and it's, it's clear to me that the, the issue is not physical. It's more the, they don't like their partner. <laughs> like, you know, there's like, <laughs> they don't there, like you. <laughs> there's like, you know, there's little things that indicate that, you know, the things aren't well with the partner and that they really need either therapy or to break up. <laughs> so, um, and th there's also more involved in the past and emotional sure. you know, wounds and things like that, that really need to come to the surface. So it's really good to have an integrated team of people to help you with all of those issues. So for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. The body keeps the score. As, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yep. 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 So yeah. my dear, well, thank you so much for spending this time with us. And, my pleasure. Um, we will you know, again, if you want to talk to Dr. Jenny, reach her through the Intimacy Institute or check out her um, Instagram page. It's intimacy underscore institute. institute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I could awesome. do a little better to bolster that page, but yes, intimacy underscore institute. That's great. <laughs> All right. Thank you, my dear. My pleasure, Michelle. Take care. <laughs>